my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Paul Farnsworth, who got a PhD from UCLA. And he currently serves as a project director with a cultural resources management firm um, based in California, Williams Self Associates. And prior to his present position, he spent many years at Louisiana State University um, as a faculty member and eventually as the chair of a rather large combined department of anthropology and geography. Um, Dr. Farnsworth research deals with British, French, and Spanish colonial systems, immigrant experiences, acculturation, and identity construction, just to highlight a few uh, foci. His fieldwork spans Louisiana, the Caribbean, and the North American West, and I found somewhere in your CV, you do crazy work as well, so or you haven't done crazy work. Uh, he's the co-author or editor of four books, numerous book chapters and journal articles, and an absolutely gigantic pile of technical reports resulting from CRM and other types of research. And just to give you sort of a sample of his work here, I'll read some of these titles. Um, title of a 2010 book, African American Archaeology in the Archaeology of Louisiana. My favorite, Sampling Many Pots, an Archaeology of Memory and Tradition of a Bahamian Plantation. And I picked out a few for, for Heather. Is that it? Ah, just for you. Fish and Grits. Southern African and British influences in Bahamian food ways and beer brewing and consumption in the maintenance of African identity. Excellent. Um, here's one for me, Native American acculturation in the Spanish colonial empire. And just to remind everyone that he also has several methodological skills of interest to both prehistorians and historians. A reevaluation of the isotopic and archaeological reconstructions of diet in the Tehuacan Valley. So, please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Paul Farnsworth. Thank you. Uh, I want to just briefly start with a preface, prologue, uh, off, off script comment. Um, as noted, I'm currently employed by a cultural resources management company in California and have been for the last almost six years now. One of the aspects of the real world, shall we say, as opposed to academia, is that uh, the workers in private industry do not own the products of their labor. Which means to say, for, the, uh, for archaeology, I do not own the data that I excavate or any of the information that I produce as a result of the projects that I work on. I may only use that information with permission of the company and have a signed contract that says that. As a result, without permission, I cannot speak about any of the research that I've been doing in the last six years or so with the company. Under other circumstances, I would have been able to ask for that permission, um, but under this context, uh, it was really not appropriate. I really don't want them to know I'm here, and I want them to know I'm not here uh, as a representative of the so, uh, for the graduate students, the whole perhaps epical point there that if you're going to CRM, it's a private industry, it is not academia. You don't own the archaeology you dig, it's the company. Until it becomes public record. Until it becomes public record, this is true. Unfortunately, the project I'd most like to have spoken about is not completed yet and is in the analysis phase, and therefore it's not. So, uh, Given that, I'm going to go back to uh, some of the research that I did as a faculty member at Louisiana State University. And since we're on the ethical side of it on this topic, let me say that this was a collaborative research project with Dr. Laurie Wilkie of the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and under our research agreement, all and any data generated as a result of the Clifton project is available to either of us to use in whichever way you can choose. So we don't sort of own the bits of the project. We both have access <coughs> to anything that resulted from the project. And so with that, uh, I'm going to talk about African Bahamian and British cultural identity in the Bahamas in the early 19th century. 
Today, I will discuss two interconnected populations in the Bahamas during, during the Loyalist period, which is 1784 to 1835. I'll explore African Bahamian and British cultural identity through an archaeological consideration of foodways at Clifton Plantation, New Providence, Bahamas. <coughs> Clifton Plantation is one of the most recent of the five plantations I have excavated. You didn't do your security check. Well, I use it to watch movies in bed. So, so yes, Clifton is one of the five plantations I excavated in the Bahamas. That's the last one of the five I worked on. Foodway is one aspect of daily practice through which ethnic and national identities are constructed. By foodways, I refer to the holistic cultural package that surrounds the procurement, preparation, consumption, and celebration of food. To study foodways is to consider the ways that food is given value and meaning by those who create and consume it. Foodways are simultaneously one of the most pliable and most conservative of cultural practices. New ingredients and techniques can be quickly incorporated suit differing, differing access to resources, yet meal structure, preparation, and service can remain remarkably intact. Archaeological remains from food waste take many forms. Floral remains, floral remains, commercial food and beverage containers, tableware, and cooking utensils, for example. Food remains consisting of shellfish remains and animal bone were recovered from each of the excavated, excavated areas of Clifton. In addition to the food remains, there is documentary evidence ceramic tablewares and storage vessels, cooking pots, beverage bottles, cutlery, and also the use of space that provide information about the ways that food was experienced at Clifton, although time does not really permit discussion of all of these. Scholars such as Michael Gomez, Michael Mullins, and Gwendolyn Midlow Hall have made convincing arguments that African ethnicities remained important in the construction of enslaved people's identities in the American South and the Caribbean until the early 19th century. While well, I would agree with Minson Price that the impact of enslavement was such that people could not replicate the whole of their social organization and experience, my form of scale social analysis in this study is the household. Community life may have been a product of collective cultural negotiation, but household life was a compromise between smaller number, numbers of people. While it may not be possible for an individual or small group of individuals to replicate an entire social order, it is in their power to ensure that food is prepared in the proper way, that lived spaces are properly inhabited and maintained, that ancestors are remembered, and that family life maintains some sense of culturally prescribed order. It was the collective values and behaviors of these smallest social units, the household, which became the basis for the construction of communal social structures and values. For the people of Clifton Plantation, village life was the main source of social interaction. It is necessary then for us to look to the potential cultural sources what came to be an African Bahamian identity at Clifton. Africans came to the Bahamas during the Loyalist period in three primary ways. They were brought as enslaved people from the Carolinas and Georgia by the Loyalists. They were brought from Africa to supply Loyalist plantations. Or they were seized as contraband from, from Spain by the British Navy after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and then apprenticed on the islands. Slaves brought by the loyalists to the Bahamas were likely drawn from Senegambia, Sierra Leone, and Central Africa. Accompanying the remaining African-born component of the loyalist slave population would have been their Creole children and grandchildren. While these younger generations had known no world other than the Americas, this is not to say that they came to the Bahamas without a sense of African heritage. Archaeologists and ethnographers have demonstrated the rich influences of the Congo and Sierra Leone in the Carolinas and Georgia Sea Islands. The largest group of enslaved people brought from Africa to the Bahamas between 1786 and 1806 was from Sierra Leone, or more, or more generically, the windward coast of Africa, representing almost one quarter of the population. When the slave trade figures for the Bahamas are compared with the broader British trade, people hailing from Sierra Leone or the windward, uh, windward coast of Africa were brought in greater proportion to the Bahamas than in the overall slave trade. After Sierra Leone, Central Africa was the next largest portion of the population, followed by peoples from the Bight of Biafra. 
Senegambia accounted for most of the remainder. Any Bahamian plantation would have been a multi-ethnic community, a Clifton where southern-born enslaved people lived with African-born enslaved and apprenticed people. There would have been people hailing either directly or ancestrally from Sierra Leone, Senegambia, Benin, Congo, and the Gold Coast. An important consequence of this demographic pattern was the transplanted southern Creole populations and newly enslaved Africans brought to the Bahamas shared a similar African cultural heritage. So, William Wiley and Clifton. William Wiley was born in Georgia in 1757, and in 1775 he went to train in England to become a lawyer. He returned to America in 1780 to fight for the crown in the Revolutionary War. In 1784 he passed the bar and was sent by the crown to Canada. But in 1787 he was appointed Solicitor General of the Bahamas, and this took him to the Bahamas. In 1799, he was appointed Attorney General of the Bahamas, and he continued in that role until 1821, when, at his request, he was transferred to St. Vincent. Wiley purchased three parcels that make up Clifton Plantation uh, by 1809, a total of 791 acres, and he then developed this as his main estate. He had a couple of other small estates. By 1821, Wiley owned 67 enslaved people, most of them living on Clifton. He owned the plantation until his death in 1828, although he sold most of the enslaved families in 1821 when he left the Bahamas. Clifton was developed by Wiley, an enthusiastic convert to Methodism, as a social experiment, not as a wealth-producing enterprise. And in that respect, he was successful. He did not make money off it. He lost money. Wiley encouraged his enslaved people to be economically self-sufficient by providing several days a week for farming. He provided transportation to the market in Nassau, and he paid them wages for the completion of extra tasks, such as uh, building stone walls. There's lots of bits of stone wall being built all over this records. These circumstances gave enslaved people at Clifton an unusual degree of consumer autonomy, evidenced in both the diversity of goods contained within the household assemblages and the inclusion of, of more luxury goods than ordinarily seen in an enslaved family's uh, sandwiches. Archaeological research was conducted at 10 structures associated with the enslaved and apprenticed Africans who lived at Clifton, as well as Wiley's main house and kitchen. Overall, at Clifton's village, land animals accounted for very little of the formal assemblage. At the village kitchen, terrestrial species only accounted for 3.4% of the identifiable specimens, with fowl, raccoon, sheep or goat, and the mouse or rat, the only species identified. Uh, raccoon and sheep or goat were the most represented in the assembly. In contrast, <coughs> the largest percentage was at cabin H, where mammals accounted for 26.5% of the identified specimens. Sheep or goat, pig, cow, and dog <coughs> were present in addition to bird, mouse or rat, and raccoon. Raccoon was the most abundant of the land animals, accounting for 35 of the 91 identified specimens, with sheep or goat following with 25 identified specimens. Raccoons are an introduced species, they are not native to the Bahamas, and they are only found on New Providence. Miller, in 1905, uh, wrote a study of Bahamian mammals he wrote to the raccoon, there is a tradition that this animal has been introduced by one of the large plantation owners many, many years ago. But from where, there seemed to be complete uncertainty. I was told Florida, but this seemed to be only a conjecture. Several of the raccoon bones showed unmistakable signs of butchery. This animal was in most of the village formal sandwiches, demonstrating that this resource was widely used by the community. Given the North American origin of this species, its incorporation in the diet of Clifton reflects uh, the influences of the people who had been raised in the American South. Zoological analyses of plantation diet in the American South have demonstrated that raccoon was an important wild food resource there. However, the preparation of the meat was not as stra straightforward, and it's likely that uh, Clifton's southern-born Creoles provided the knowledge that enabled the villagers to use raccoon, uh, <coughs> raccoon meat. 
The limited consumption of domesticated animals in the diet of Clifton is somewhat surprising when you consider that in 1818, of the people allocated for provisioning grounds at Clifton, all but one family was documented as raising fowl, and 10 of the 18 were noted as raising hogs. However, in his answers to an 1815 African Institute questionnaire, Wiley describes provisioning practices in the Bahamas. They are allowed as much ground as they choose to cultivate, and they are universally permitted to raise hogs and poultry. It is true to a proverb that no Negro ever eats his own fowl or kills his own pig. They sell them all. Shellfish and bony fish provided the bulk of the meat consumed in the village. One would not need to venture too far to obtain these resources, merely to the shore's edge, about 600 meters away from the village, where they could be collected from the reef system of Clifton Bay. Fish bones are covered from low site F, G, H, I, and L, though in greatly varying quantities. A comparison of the fish bone reveals that the greatest number of identified elements came from sea basses, grunts, snappers, and porgies, with these families accounting for approximately 90% of the specimens identified at each of the houses in the village. The less abundant fish varied slightly between the houses, with a greater percentage of wrasses identified at the village kitchen, and the greater percentage of parrotfish being recovered from the yards of the houses G and H. While the composition of the former sandwich demonstrates that the same fish were deposited in about the same proportion, there were some differences in what parts of the fish were represented. The four of the house sites grouped by the sandwiches were predominantly composed of head elements, whereas smaller fish like grunts, snappers, and hinds were represented by bones from the entire body. This would suggest that enslaved people were eating panfish, as well as taking advantage of the heads of the groupers procured for William Wiley's table. Shellfish were recovered from each of the house sites, though with varying densities. When we compare the amounts of flesh represented by a particular species, the same four shellfish species accounted for the vast majority of the protein at each house, with queen conch the most important, followed by tiger leucine, whelk, and fuzzy chitin. The emphasis on the consumption of marine resources represents both the cultural continuity from coastal West African foodways and an economic strategy commonly employed in the American South where fish and shellfish were often used to supplement the meager plantation rations. In the Bahamas, planters were required to provision their enslaved people with legally set minimum quantities of corn. Struggling to keep plantations economically viable, Bahamian planters increasingly turned to requiring enslaved people to self-provision in return for reduced workloads, land allocations, and additional days off. This practice was followed at Clifton, where provisioning grounds ranged from a half to four acres. On these grounds, families were reported to be cultivating maize, sorghum, yams, potatoes, pumpkins, and squashes, peas, beans, okra, sesame, groundnuts, taro, plantain, banana, water, and muskmelon. The produce grown in the provision grounds of Clifton provided opportunities for continuities in African foodways. These crops fit into the typical array described by visitors to West Africa through the late 18th and early 19th centuries. One important aspect of material culture, according to many Africanists, is the vibrant creativity and innovation that continually marks African cultural practice, whether in the forms of rituals or the construction of material culture. The collective aesthetic traditions of the diverse people who lived at Clifton represent a potential universe of inspiration and knowledge that may have informed the construction of the material assemblages. The ceramics used in food consumption and other artifacts can be viewed from the perspective how similar choices between households may be indicative of the creation of a Bahamian aesthetic that was shaped, but not dictated, by particular African aesthetic traditions. Due to the large number of African-born individuals among the people of Clifton, however, one cannot ignore the possibility that particular designs or symbols may have been consciously selected for their similarity to specific African motifs or symbols. The ceramic assemblages of the Clifton households were primarily the products of individual household consumer decision-making not provisioning by the planter, which is very important to design. In comparing the assemblages to the Clifton, from the Clifton quarters, the importance of factory turned stickwares and hand-painted wares in the assemblages is striking. As has been detailed elsewhere, these particular kinds of European ceramics bear structural similarities in form, decoration, and color palettes to the pots, calabashes, and fabric designs popular among and common to the Congo, Windward Coast, Benin, and Gold Coast peoples who are likely have lived at Clifton. The popularity of these particular decorative types seems to be an expression of emerging African Bahamian aesthetic. 
However, further consideration of the individual household assemblies also demonstrates the great diversity in specific pattern choices. Studies of modern EBA have emphasized the great variation in inventiveness that women express through their selection of household goods, including pottery. Studies of the Maroons of Suriname found that while that women and men alike take great pride in being innovative in their artistic pursuits and value creativity in the work of others. When one looks at the Clifton households, one finds that among the banded and hand-painted ceramics alone, there are 20 patterns that are represented between at least two houses. But 66 patterns occur in only one household. Among the four houses with the largest ceramic assemblages, no more than about half of the assemblage overlaps with other households. In other words, for most of these houses, half or more of the ceramic patterns used were unique to that particular household. If one looks at the overlap between any particular two households, one finds that no two houses had any more than one third of their patterns in common. And that was rare. The assemblages were somewhat unified between households by a general tendency to select ceramics decorated in similar ways. But within that generality, specific color preferences and pattern choices seem to have been more individualized by household. Although not of their own manufacture, the ceramics and other goods found in the village and the beach houses were material expressions of their labor, productivity, creativity, and personal taste and sense of style, communicated in an African way. Multiple lines of evidence suggest that Locust G was the driver's residence. I'm standing in front of the public, but G is down here. Uh, the driver's residence was occupied by Jack, the driver, and his wife, Sue Eve. Both were African-born and resided in the cabin with their two children. In their assemblage, one sees some evidence of how specific ethnic heritage <coughs> could be communicated through European goods. While their assemblage shared many traits with the rest of the houses, several elements of their assemblage suggest a Central African or Congo heritage. Archaeologists and art historians have recounted in depth the importance of the image of the cross as a possible symbolic shorthand for the Bakongo cosmogram in the diaspora. In its original form, the Bakongo cosmogram is a circle, quartered by an X with small circles on the end of each arm, which represents the four movements of the sun, the cycle of life and death, and the annual progression of the seasons. Locus G contains an example of an English hand-painted pillowed bowl featuring a design that unintentionally mimics the Bakongo cosmogram on its interior base. On the broken shirt, the design is neatly centered, and it may have been curated after the bowl was even broke. The likeness of the cosmogram is also found in the design along the border of three hand-painted bowls featuring a peacock feather, as well as on an engine turn bowl. Two examples of the highly embossed British pipes found at the same house may also depict the same beliefs as in the cosmogram. These pipes feature the prominent beehive surrounded by flying bees and flowering vines. The beehive resembles the shape of an African and Bahamian termite mound, which in Congo belief are associated with the dead, while flying insects and birds are associated with the souls of the living. Thus, the juxtaposition of life and death is communicated through the design on the pipe. And in this context, perhaps the bird representations on the hand-painted bowls are referred to before maybe took on greater significance as well. Stepping back to consider the whole village, if the diversity of each household's ceramic assemblage conveyed the beauty, creativity, wealth, economic success, and individuality of their owners, what is the meaning of those uh, instances where the patterns overlap? A purely practical explanation, and I'm sure accounts for some of this, could be that some of the households share the expenses of ceramic acquisition, buying larger lots of particular vessels and patterns and then sharing them between the households. Another explanation is that most of the overlap between households is a result of social connectedness of particular households in the village. For example, Bahamians will, will often share a pot of food with neighbors with the expectation that the courtesy will be returned at a later date. Bahamian informants talked about taking a plate or a bowl over to another house to share the food. It would be expected that the vessels would be returned subsequently at some point in time. But you, one can imagine how th those vessels were broken in that other household or during the process of being carried from one to another and end up in the other family's uh, yard or house. Within the quarters, the consideration of the overlapping ceramic patterns between households 
suggests that something more than geographic proximity between houses was a factor in the distribution. For instance, well, the families who lived in the structures F and G down here are in closest proximity to each other uh, compared to any other families. They have limited overlap between them, only one pattern on two vessels. In contrast, locus G down here at the bottom has the greatest overlap with the household of locus L up here, six cabins away, and six different patterns are in common between those two households. And this is also despite the fact that locus L there had one of the smallest uh, samples of ceramics recovered, even though the amount of excavation there was uh, as extensive, if not more so, than other houses. These connections between households may represent ethnic, or perhaps occupational, or maybe age-related bonds between the households. That we shall probably never know. But I believe they represent some sort of connection <coughs> between these households. So in the ever visible to others life of the, in the village house yards, household materials were always on display. They were always visible to be interpreted and, and evaluated by others. The co compilation of household assemblies was more, was more than an action of static consensus building within the community, but also a means of continuously positioning and, and identifying oneself relative to others in the community, i.e. one's individuality, but also the message of community. The ability to leave examples of strikes with another household, accompanying a gift of a meal, uh, may have been a way of asserting bonds of reciprocity and indebtedness with that household. So let's talk a little bit about British food. <coughs> Even though they controlled, at least nominally, all elements of the enslaved people's lives, plants in the Bahamas in the late 18th and early 19th century were a very small minority on most of the major islands in the colony. Many planters found themselves on rather small Bahamian islands separated by hundreds of miles of water from Nassau. The sole city of the colony, Nassau was the center of all things British in the Bahamas. Even on New Providence, home to Nassau, the average <coughs> population was outnumbered. The island had a large African and African descent population, much of it enslaved, but also with a sizable number of free people. However, Nassau wasn't exactly central to British colonial interests in the Caribbean. And Nassau certainly wasn't like London or Liverpool or any of the many towns in England of its similar size. Thus, when we're considering British cultural identity in the Bahamas in the 19th century, we are looking at a colonial backwater with some people living in locations that must have seemed pretty close to the ends of the earth as they knew it. How do you stay British when you're outnumbered, out of contact with home, and far from even the semblance of a major, major British community? How does one create and, and maintain an imperial identity? The Loyalists, who form the majority of the British population of the Bahamas, are a particularly interesting population in which to study the construction of Anglo identity. These were people who, in many instances, like William Wiley, had spent large parts of their lives in the American colonies. While their loyalty to the king and family connections to the motherland may have marked them as British, um, due to the reality really is that they were a creolized British population. And they were attempting to reassert their Britishness after having been kicked out of British North America, at least America, the United States, I suppose. So, looking at the food, Bahamian food today bears several unmistakable British influences. Some examples, uh, several local food sources have British names. The triggerfish has given the name turbot, and it's prepared in a British fashion. Um, goat is referred to as mutton. I, I never knew mutton was actually goat. I came to the Caribbean, mutton is sheep. But anyway, mutton in the Bahamas is goat. West Indian top shells are called whelks. I was very familiar with Welks as a child growing up in England. It's not that I ever liked them. They certainly don't look like the uh, West Indian top shop, at least to my eyes. Guava duff is a British steamed pudding. It uses tropical filling, guava, as, as the filling of it. So you've got local uh, food sources being incorporated into the diet, but they're being used in British form and identified in British ways. Period travel accounts provide some insight into the meals served by the British elite in the Bahamas. Dr. P.S. Townsend of New York visited the Bahamas for an extended period from 1823 to 1824, 
And during that time, he was entertained by many of Nassau's leading uh, uh, British families, the elite British families, I should say. The doctor took special joy in recounting and comparing the quality of meals he experienced at different affairs in his diary. It's, it's quite amusing. His diary largely consists of day by day what he ate and the great joy he experienced in it. So, uh, it's, just, it's, it's a good read. One dish that was universally served was turtle soup. This is an extremely time-consuming dish to make and thus worthy of serving to guests. And it took advantage of the local availability of sea turtles, which are now in danger. Uh, cow's foot jelly, presumably prepared from cattle raised on the island, and lobster dishes were other elite quality dishes that took advantage of locally available resources. Among the elite, trade provided access to imported foods. Guests of Bahamian hosts described wines, liquors, cheeses, canned goods, and imported meats, such as corned beef, exotic fowl, and even venison being imported for consumption in the wealthiest homes. For Christmas dinner in 1823, Dr. Townsend enjoyed, quote, fine Scotch salmon, preserved fresh, excellent champagne, claret, plum pudding and turtle soup, and Irish whiskey. Another dinner, early 1924, featured quote, two giant margate fish and shrimp sauce, which latter is a great delicacy and reminded me of Liverpool, from whence it was probably imported. A fine turkey, a piece of roast beef, dessert of pies and jellies and custard. A pair of roast ducks was brought in with these last, a la mode Francoise. Wines, claret and Madeira. Very choice. In these descriptions, of which the good doctor provided many, one can see how imported goods were used to create both a sense of luxury and British authenticity in the meals. These accounts help inform our understanding of the archaeological remains related to plant food bodies in the Bahamas. Uh, William Wiley's kitchen, um, we basically um, excavated a little bit of the plantation house, more of the kitchen. Although it's not the main focus of the uh, William Wiley's kitchen sandwich features uh, the best preserved formal sandwich associated with a Bahamian platter. Even so, his sandwich is small, featuring only 134 identifiable, bo identifiable bones. Several general observations can be made about this sandwich, however. Of the 134 identifiable bones, 51% were from mammals. With the overwhelming majority of that represented by cow, sheep or goat. Bird only accounts for about 5% of the assemblage. And one snake vertebra, don't know where the ate that. Two marine turtle shells were recovered. The presence of turtle suggests that the Clifton Plantation turtle soup was enjoyed by the planter family. Further archaeological evidence suggests that the turtles were kept on the site. There is a feature cut in the bedrock of one of Clifton's rocky beaches. The three foot deep square cut feature always contains water and it's replenished during high tide by a trench through the rock cut from the shore to the sea. This feature was described by Stark in an 1891 publication as having been used to pen sea turtles. No evidence of turtles was recovered from any of the structures excavated in the enslaved people's village. Fish accounted for 43% of the identified bones from Wiley's assemblage. The groupers make up almost 50% of the identified fish specimens. Porgies at 22%, grunts at 17%, snappers at 11%, and one single lone mackerel make up the rest of the identified fish specimens. The planter assemblage is characterized by the consumption of large individuals. The porgies represented would have weighed at least 7 pounds, while the groupers would have been in the 10 to 15 pound range. Even the grunt, a species typically weighing about a pound, was a larger individual that probably weighed between three and four pounds. The mackerel is interesting because it is a deeper water species, and its inclusion in the assemblage suggests that the plant of family uh, fish were not just procured from the plantation's shore, uh, where the enslaved population basically fishing, but they were able to go out further beyond the reef and have access to fish obtained uh, from deeper water. The um, the vertebrate recovered from the plant's house of uh, the mackerel indicates that the fish had been filleted. Several of the other fish vertebrae recovered in the assemblage have been chopped in half, indicating that the removal of the heads and the tails from the body of the, from the fish. And as I noted before, it seemed like some of the group of heads ended up in the, in the village houses. There. 
So the planter assembly shows a different pattern of food consumption from that seen in enslaved people's village. While fish and shellfish were the predominant source of protein for the enslaved people, domesticated mammal species and large fish were the dominant uh, food sources for the planter assemblage. Uh, evidence of commercially packaged foods like potted meats, sauces, pickles, and other condiments were recovered from the planter's kitchen, as was, evident, as was evidence of imported beer, wine, and liquor. From Wiley's house, one fragment of glass stemware was recovered, indicating some degree of style on Wiley's dinner table. Well, at least one stylish glass. Overall tablewares dominated uh, the Wiley's household collection. Only one fragment of uh, porcelain blue and white hand painted teacup was recovered, suggesting that Wiley's wealth was more limited than the wealthy planters he prosecuted in court. And documentary evidence tends to confirm this in the form of several requests to the king for increased pay and documenting uh, his income and how pathetic he felt it was. Um, functional analysis of the ceramics demonstrated that the distribution of best forms is similar to that from several other uh, North American plantation excavations. An emphasis on plates over bowls, for example, and almost a third of the collection being tea and coffee wares, matches what is typically, typically considered to be an Anglo pattern. If one looks just at the proportions of flatwares to hollowwares, at a four to one plate to bowl ratio, Wiley had a much higher proportion of plates than has been found at many southeastern plantations, which seem to range from about three to two down to about one to one. While there may well be good functional reasons for this, it may also be that we're seeing an example of the over-exaggeration of an Anglo pattern in a remote location. Um, I'm not sure how aware of this you are, but it's sort of feeling among the British expatriates are more British than the British. And I think that might be what we're seeing here, is trying to be more British than the British. Anyway. Um, turning to the decorative techniques used on wireless ceramics, 19% of the earthen wares were undecorated, 31% were minimally decorated, 19% were hand painted, and 31% were 